when you hire somebody there, you hire them because there's a job to do and they want to get their job done. Uh, failing to take into account that some of these rules and security mechanisms get in the way of doing the job isn't really a good thing to do. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative and WIDS is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the best-selling CISO Compass Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as from other top CISOs and security thought leaders. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To to learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Eugene Spafford, professor at Purdue University, where he has been for over 35 years and has over 44 years in computing, arguably one of the most senior academics in the field of cybersecurity. My original computing work was in um reliable distributed computing in the area of working with fault tolerance and uh, building operating systems that would continue to function and databases that would continue to function uh, even in the event of a, a hardware or software failure and and that was interesting um got some good results out of it but uh i i realized that a lot of that depended on getting correct software so I then did some work in software engineering and working on program correctness and testing. And as I was doing that, I'd also, as a hobby, had been doing some work in security. But more and more, I realized that uh, uh, the most important failures might be some of the ones caused by people. And so I began to focus more of my work in um, working in uh, cybersecurity, as we call it now. So that was really the genesis is all along being concerned with computers, uh, computing resources, doing what they're supposed to do, and trying to address some of the causes as to why they might not. Very interesting. And, and you've been with uh, Purdue University for quite a while now, right? Uh, this is my 36th year I'm in the process. I've been here 35 and I'm now underway in my 36th year. Wow, that's amazing. I know I know you've had some great contributions to the uh, information uh, security or cybersecurity or whatever we want to call it today uh, field. And, and you have uh, you know several lifetime uh, achievement awards uh, as well. It, it's uh, it's added up. Uh, I think being consistent and uh, working at a set of goals over time contributes to that. I I haven't done it all by myself, and it wasn't. And there were long periods of time where nothing happened uh, or some setbacks. Uh, but uh, as I look back now, it it uh, uh, there there is quite a body of work. Um, Next year, we're celebrating the uh, 25th anniversary of Sirius, which is the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research institute that I founded at Purdue. And so that's another kind of milestone to look back at with a little bit of amazement. I don't, I don't feel quite that old, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, indeed, the record seemed to support it. Well, well that's amazing to, you know, to keep something, something going that long. So, so you have uh, a, a new book uh, that's coming out, uh, talking about the uh, cyber security myths. Uh, could you tell us a, a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, the book is supposed to come out from uh, Addison Wesley Pearson uh, sometime near the end of the year. It may get pushed to January. It could be late November. We don't have an exact date yet. 
And the book is in collaboration with two just outstanding researchers in different areas. Um, so Lee Metcalf, uh, who is at the uh, CERT SEI in uh, Pittsburgh, and Josiah Dykstra, who's with the National Security Agency uh, in Maryland. And I, we together wrote this book um, that is um, on cybersecurity myths and misconceptions. And um, all of us in our careers have seen people who work in the field at various levels, from low levels up to CISOs and members of boards of directors, who have believed things that aren't true, or who have fallen prey to various kinds of logical fallacies and arguments. And as a result, uh, the overall security of systems that we use isn't as good as it could be. And we decided to write a book about it. Well, uh, I, I think that's excellent. And I have uh, pre-ordered the book um, myself uh, through Amazon, and, uh, and, and I can't wait to get it. Um, so tell us, let's walk through what, what are some of those uh, myths uh, that, that we should be aware of? Well, I think um, you know, we started off the book with addressing some topics that people sort of take for granted. And that is that as a field or as a group, we understand what cybersecurity is and we understand what the Internet is. And in truth, we don't really understand, have a good definition for either. They are fuzzy concepts that um, different groups define different ways. So part of that was just even defining what cybersecurity is all about and really pointing out that it, it's more often about the practice of risk reduction than it is anything in the computing technology per se. Um, then we uh, spent some time in the book talking about various cognitive biases. And these are things that we, we all do. We have as, you know, some call them rules, as th rules of thumb or other, their, their psychological susceptibility. But these are things that cause us to evaluate situations uh, poorly and come to wrong conclusions, uh, such as the availability bias or, or frequency bias that we have when we look at events and judge some things to be more likely than others, uh, or the well-known survivorship bias that leads us to sometimes to getting products or configurations that cope with the last set of problems, not the actual ones that are facing us. Um, we talk about uh, various kinds of, of uh, faulty assumptions and fallacies. Um, you know, the, the, the fallacies people have heard before, the straw hacker and um, correlations, not causation and balance effect and those kinds of things. Um, a number of uh, things having to do with assumptions about... Uh, Oh, the idea that my company is too small or insignificant to be a target or that um, I can never be secure, so why should I bother, which is you know, a faulty assumption. Uh, or that are, better are there are there companies that, that are taking that approach today? Oh yes, yes. Not big ones, but many small ones. Um, this is particularly a problem for yeah, we would call them the mom and pop stores, but uh, you know, smaller businesses assume that because of their size, no, they're not going to be a problem. Or people at home assume that. But but those are are, are ones who fall victim to having their systems taken over as platforms for botnets or um, uh, ransomware uh, because they don't understand the risk and they don't understand the value of a connected system online. Do those small companies do they do they survive after those attacks? Or are you seeing that you know when they get those those events that they're um, able to to find their way out of it? Many of small and even medium sized enterprises um, do limp out of the experience uh, with a lot of resources depleted. They lose opportunity because of what they've had to spend. 
and some don't survive because they simply can't afford what's necessary to resume operation. Uh, this is not well documented. It doesn't make the news at a national level or an industry level because it's, and while it's not the kind of news that would normally be seen there, uh, but it is happening on a regular basis. And, and the news today had that the Department of Justice is forming a network of computer crime prosecutors across the country, in part because of this increased uh, level of attacks against not only small businesses, but local governments, local police departments, education, schools. Mm. Uh, they they all are, are suffering, and some of them, the the losses are effectively terminal for the organization. So, uh, yeah, that's... That's just one little aspect of what we talk about. And we do a lot. We talk about people, the what you invest in people, how you treat people. Um, because people are often overlooked. That's one of the misconceptions is that more technology is better when really it's the people that make the difference. Mm The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. So with all the security awareness training that, that's gone on today where, you know, every organization are doing, you know, phishing campaigns and, and, and you know, doing more security awareness training is, 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 is that not enough or, or what are we missing with the, the people aspect? Um, well, not every organization does that. And a lot of the training that's done is oriented around punishment uh, or negative outcomes for people if they make a mistake rather than thinking about how to integrate the controls and the people into a workable whole. Um, uh, too many organizations don't think about how to empower uh, their their workforce to take better security. They think that by putting up rules and antivirus and firewalls and anti-phishing, and then really reminding and, and penalizing people if they don't follow those rules, that that's going to work. But when you hire somebody there, you hire them because there's a job to do and they want to get their job done. Uh, failing to take into account that some of these rules and security mechanisms get in the way of doing the job isn't really a good thing to do. And, and then we also see cases where people blame users rather than really putting the responsibility at the more root causes, which is the environment, the configuration, the operation. So uh, uh, the, the the stories we've seen in the news on a regular basis where somebody blames an intern for setting a weak password a as being the problem or leaving the permissions off of something. Um, the, the fact that the processes and the structure allows those things to happen is the real problem, not the fact that somebody has an all too human failing, uh, especially someone, an intern hasn't hasn't been trained well to be in these circumstances. Why are they given the responsibility and access to something that could cause that kind of damage? That's really where we should be looking. So, so these are the kinds of things we talk about. We also, we talk some about uh, legal issues, uh, uh, placing too much faith in tools, vulnerability disclosure, malware. Um, we have a chapter, a primer on some statistics to better understand various reports and claims that people make. And uh, uh, the whole thing is all wrapped up with examples. We hope some, some humorous, and we have uh, nearly 40 whimsical illustrations in it to uh, help make some of the points to get across. Uh, that we hope people will find amusing. Um, what statistic do you find uh, the most amusing statistic that is is often often quoted that probably isn't right? 
That's a good question. Um, and one that I don't know I can answer right off the top. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a lot that are appalling. Uh, most of the ones that I am troubled by are the ones where people talk about um, malware detection or intrusion detection, and they quote numbers about the percentage. So you know, they find 99% of all bad traffic, uh, but fail to point out that the 1%, maybe 1% 1 of um, a million accesses per day, and 1% of that is still an awful lot for somebody to have to wade through. So it's no surprise that a number of systems are frustrating or don't work or get turned off because those numbers misrepresent what's really going on. Mm -hmm. and, and how do organizations, uh, you mentioned tools, how do organizations figure out the right number of tools. I hear this over and over and over again, that organizations have so many tools that they that they just, they aren't using all the full functionality of them, but it's easier sometimes to just bring in another, another tool. Yes. Yeah, I, I think one number that we ran across, I don't know how reliable it is, but uh, said that larger organizations may have 37 different tools that they're using in their security enterprise. And certainly bigger ones, if that's the average, then there's more than that in some places, as many as a, maybe a hundred. Uh, that says something, first of all, about the security industry, about what a poor job we're doing, uh, building integrated tool sets and building the underlying software. But the second aspect is it's a, it's a failure at the level of management to really understand what it is that needs to be protected and what it is that staff are should have a responsibility to execute and um how best to train and allocate that personnel uh to to meet the goals an awful lot of tools are obtained because they do one extra thing that than what's currently in place or perhaps because somebody in a position of purchasing authority uh, think it's valuable or it's part of a bundle. And that's a problem in and of itself. We obtain too many tools. It's difficult to be expert in all of them and to know when to use them. So there, there's, a, there's a complex uh, ecology there of security tools, training, responsibility, and risk awareness that needs to be managed and in many organizations it's not managed well do you think there's an optimal number of tools an organization should be trying to target this goes back to the idea of defining what security is uh, understanding your risk tolerance and what it is you're protecting so if you're if you're taking uh, sales orders across the internet you're going to have a somewhat different environment than an organization that is um, providing services or writing software. And so the set of tools you need are going to be different. If you're large enough to have your own in-house response team, you will need a set of tools for them that you won't need if you outsource uh, your security to a different team. So it, it there's no single answer. It, it really depends on what it is that you uh are are doing as part of your business your core business and how you're capitalizing and organizing your protection against what you view as threats do, do you think that we've increased our our risk uh by moving to the cloud or have we have we reduced our our risk in in some organizations that way yeah this is another one of those it depends answers unfortunately um for smaller organizations, if they are making an informed move to the cloud, they're probably better off because they're less prone to certain kinds of disruption. They may be getting some automatic backup in the cloud. Uh, cloud services that are staffed with professional people are, are probably better than the company can afford if they were to have them part time. Larger organizations that can afford their own in-house staff, their own redundant servers, their own tool sets may be better off 
uh, not in the cloud or in a private cloud that they establish themselves because they have better control over some of the parameters and knowing where information is and who has access. Uh, it is clearly the case that some organizations that move to the cloud without understanding the exposure that that brings uh, are in a worse position than they may have been before. So uh, this goes to one of the big myths that we have. There is no silver bullet. There is no one thing that is going to solve the problem for every organization because every organization has different needs, different backgrounds, different size, different risks. And that has to be thought about and solutions structured accordingly. Mm -hmm. So what's your, what's your favorite myths that you've uh, put it, put in the book? Um, so the, some of my, my favorite myths go to ones that uh, uh, marketers talk about how their products are going to find all of a certain kind of vulnerability or um, all malware, or all intrusions, whatever. And uh, from a, a purely formal point of view, that's impossible. Um, we, we know that that simply can't be done. Uh, so that's that's one that I think that's interesting. Another one is and it has been for a while, the the people who believe that somehow if it occurs in the internet and enough people do it, uh, law doesn't apply. Well, that's certainly not the case. And we are seeing that more and more. Um, people getting in trouble for things they're posting online. So that's, again, one of the ones that I find Amusing may not be the right word. It's sort of sadly amusing mm -hmm. uh, that um, that we see. And I, I guess the last one is the the sense that um, um, what we do online is is controllable because we control the technology. And, and again, this gets back to the fact it's people. Um, that that the people who think they can they can solve all the problems or or affect the solutions solely by investing in technology are really missing the big picture because humans are the ones who write build the technology operate the technology uh, and are affected by the technology and if they're trying to do their jobs or they're trying to get around the controls they will. Uh, and and that has to be understood. That's an intrinsic part of security. I I, I think that's great perspectives. And uh, Gene Spaff, uh, it's been it's been great to have this conversation today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the to the the book coming out. Um, you, you know, it adds that different dimension uh, for CISOs. We've written a lot about leadership things in the CISO Compass book. Uh, but I think your book takes this into uh, things that we should be thinking about um, all the time uh, as we're leading organizations. And so thanks much for uh, taking the time. Is is there any final uh, advice that you'd like to give to current CISOs, emerging CISOs, or experienced CISOs uh, as they uh, go down this journey? Um, I, I guess the two things and i'll say one thing about the book by the way when you get it i'd love to hear your feedback after you've read it uh and true for anybody else who's read it because uh we're always interested in in learning more and that ties into one of the two things i would tell CISOs and anybody working in security is don't stop learning because the field is constantly changing changing and believing that you know it all or you know most of the important things is a, a sure way to fall behind it, it's really important to continue to uh, um, to uh, learn as you go, and and to consider that that bigger picture. And, and then the last one is we need to support uh, people coming into the field. And some of them are going to come through academia. Some are going to come through the military or, or government service. Some are just going to learn on their own. But we need to be better at supporting them and training them, bringing them in, rather than acting as gatekeepers to only trying to take the most experienced. 
because otherwise we're not going to meet the shortfalls and the needs as as a community we have to we have to grow ourselves absolutely um that i i think that's great advice uh great place to leave it um thanks so much for taking the time i know you're a, a very busy person so thank you very much great talking to you todd thank you so much WIZ is on a mission to help every organization rapidly identify and remove critical risks in their cloud environments. Purpose-built for the cloud, WIZ delivers full-stack visibility, accurate risk prioritization, and enhanced business agility. WIZ connects in minutes using an agentless approach that scans both platform configurations and inside every workload. We perform a deep assessment that goes beyond what standalone CSPM and CWPP tools offer to find the toxic combination of flaws that represent real risk. To learn more about Wiz, please visit securityweekly.com/wiz.